and welcome to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisenthal. Joe, I, I feel like I'm going to jinx things by <laughs> saying this, but it feels like inflation is maybe starting to come down a little bit. At least it's not accelerating. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Well, here's how I, here's what I've been thinking about, which is that for the last year, the last year and a half, We've done all of these episodes on like supply chains and disruptions for this or that reason. And all of the various times we've um, used the term perfect storm to describe <laughs> certain things in certain industries. Perfect storm of perfect and storms. My guess right now, you know, in January 2023, is that 2023's episodes will be a little less dominated by these topics. Mm. That would be my guess. I'm guessing that this year we do a few fewer perfect storm episodes. I think that's right. But I think. You know, we, we spoke a lot about what it was that people didn't see coming when it yes. comes to inflation. Why did a lot of economists get it wrong? Why was the inflation that was supposed to be transitory? You know, maybe it was transitory in the sense that it was narrow, you know, not a big sort of like macro unleashed inflation, but it definitely stuck around longer than yeah. a lot of people expected. And so every time we have these big questions like why aren't we better at forecasting yeah. inflation? It provides an opportunity to maybe learn something and start thinking about it in a slightly different way. Well, yeah, absolutely. And I would say there's really two things that I feel are unanswered by all of the conversations that we've had uh, in the last year. So one is still like, is inflation like a macro or a micro thing? Did mm -hmm. it happen because a few categories uh, really had some disruptions and then spilled elsewhere and therefore it's not really about fiscal or monetary policy specifically and b okay we do have very high inflation right now even if there's evidence coming down what tool like if it is the case that a lot of it is related to disruptions and chip shortages and freezes in texas etc what are the tools that are best to address that? Because it is important to get inflation down. But on the other hand, there's a pretty good argument that if the issue is some sort of disruption at the ports or whatever, that sort of like strict blunt instruments like raising rates, raising rates aren't yeah. necessarily the best uh, approach to dealing with that kind of inflation. Or raising rates won't grow more trees to That's turn right. into lumber and That's things right. like that. Or, or more births at the ports or anything like that. So I'm so glad you said that because today we are going to be speaking with one of our Odd Lots favorites. Favorites, and she has just written a new paper, uh, which she says is inspired by some of the conversations that we've had on Odd Lots. But it's also just really interesting because it presents a new sort of third way, yeah, potentially, of thinking about inflation. Not transitory, not persistent, a new more interesting <laughs> third option. And that maybe could help us think about ways of accepting, yes, inflation is real. It is a problem, but that some of these blunt instruments that just treat inflation as a function of there's too much money in the economy, we need there to be less. Maybe there are better approaches than just this sort of like blunt monetary approaches to addressing them. Absolutely. So without further ado, we are going to be speaking today to Isabella Weber. She is, of course, a economics professor over at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and you might remember her from, from some previous episodes. So Isabella, thank you so much for coming back on Odd Lots. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So the paper is called Inflation in Times of Overlapping Emergencies, Systemically Significant Prices from an Input-Output Perspective. But I just want to get you to say on camera that this is inspired by Oddbots. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I mean, I have been listening to your podcast all through the pandemic. Um, and as you were just saying, obviously, you have been tracing all these um, price shocks that have been rippling through the economy. So um, this paper is trying to come up with a framework to trace these shocks and ripple effects um, in a somewhat more aggregate and yeah. possibly less fine print, but maybe a little bit more like formal <laughs> kind of fashion. I love that. The most self-serving first question we've ever <laughs> asked on an interview. What is, you know, what, it, what is uh, an input-output approach mean? Mm. Because my understanding is that this is actually like a very old idea in economics, but that is some kind of, has actually been forgotten is my understanding. And that the sort of like various versions of monetarist thinking, which sort of treat if prices are high, if we want to understand prices, we'll just look at how much money or how much credit is in the economy, rein that in. 
And you seem this paper seems to be like going back to like an older tradition in economics. Can you talk a little bit about what this is? Yeah. So as you said, we tend to think about inflation as a macro phenomenon, right? Where it's basically just about the movement of aggregate measures. Whereas what we are trying to do here is to think of um, prices as um, kind of an interconnected network where um, since one sector's output is another sector's input mm -hmm. um, and therefore one sector's um, output prices are the cost of another sector, um, you can kind of trace um, the price movements across the whole production network, which um, input output tables allow you to do. So these tables basically like register um, the relationships of input and outputs um, across the whole economy. Historically, um, input output uh, tables really had a breakthrough during the war time, hmm. um, where the question was, um, how can we hit the enemy's um, uh, economy in ways huh. um, that we kind of like with the minimal number of bombs um, create the maximal damage wow. to really um, I mean, <laughs> undermine um, the enemy economy's ability to even fight a war. I mean, concretely, of course, this is mainly about the German economy. Um, and so therefore, it really is a method of um, identifying points um, that are of particular systemic significance for the economy as a whole. Back then, the idea was to identify these points of vulnerability to, um, I mean, as I said, uh, create destruction. Um, the idea of our paper is to say, if we can identify these points of vulnerabilities, then we can actually um, kind of um, know what, what the potential sources of, um, of uh, these ripple effects that can create um, macro outcomes um, could be. So if some prices matter more than others, we want to know what these prices are. And input output is one method of trying to identify these systemically significant sectors. Uh, so Tracy, my takeaway from that is that in a war, <laughs> it makes more sense to say bomb an oil refinery than a candy factory. Like it, right? Like if you're thinking well, about, well, what are these sectors that will have the biggest ripple effects across the economy, then that would be the implication. Well, maybe we should talk about morale in that context. Okay. But no, okay. There, there's another <laughs> there's another analogy um, that you use in the paper, which is, you know, if you're trying to identify systemically important sources of inflation and maybe address them before they start actually contributing to price increases. It's kind of like trying to identify systemically important banks and then making hmm. sure that they, you know, hold more regulatory capital or maybe go under preemptive stress tests or things like that. Can you talk about maybe, you know, before we get into policy solutions, can you talk about how that approach maybe differs to traditional ways of thinking about inflation because you know in my mind there's really there's the monetarist view it's all about the money supply and then there's a sort of new keynesian view where it's more about you know su supply side and capacity and demand and things like that can you place this new approach in the context mm. of of those two older um ways of thinking about it so as different as like kind of monetarism and new Keynesianism or Keynesianism um, uh, can be, they share the understanding that inflation is always driven by macroeconomic factors, right? Now, what we are doing here, I mean, in one case, it's um, the, the distance from from uh, aggregate capacity utilization. In the other case, it's uh, more that like classic story of too much money chasing too too few goods. But still, it's like trying to locate the the origins of inflation on the aggregate level. What we are trying to do here is to say, well, if there are micro origins of inflation, if shocks to specific sectors can matter in ways that they can unleash processes that actually um, unsettle the stability of um, prices overall, then we want to understand what these sectors are. We want to know where these points of vulnerability um, are so that we can react um, to these shocks before they kind of ripple throughout the whole system. Mm. And as you said, um, interest rates are already being recognized as a systemically significant um, uh, uh, kind of price, right? That's why we have mm. central banks, right. which of course, historically at some point was also not the case. So it was a historical evolution to recognize the systemic significance of interest rates. So in some sense, what we are arguing here is to um, is to say that there are more prices than the price of borrowing money that can acquire systemic significance in ways that can have 
um, uh, uh, very large implications for monetary stability. Just a shout out, we are drawing here on the work also of Saula Omarova, who has been working on systemically significant prices uh, yeah. for a while. Someone else we definitely have to have on the podcast yeah. uh, at some point. It's so funny because, you know, of course, and we talked about this the last time you were on uh, late last year, you took a lot of heat for saying, well, maybe there's a time for having some discussion about price controls. And everyone freaked out about that. And yet they're like, OK, now let's control the price of money as if that isn't a form of price control. And yet, of course, central banking, yeah, the ultimate price control, the ultimate price control. But, you know, so. I joked, but I guess it's not really a joke, that like there are some areas where it's kind of obvious that some sort, some functions in the economy are more crucial to other industries than others. So an oil refinery is going to be more crucial to other industries than a candy factory. But that's obvious. How do you go about systematically identifying beyond the sort of really crude uh, examples. What is this, this sort of like a rigorous or empirical approach to actually identifying what parts of the economy are in fact the most likely to have ripple effects elsewhere? So what we have done in this paper is that we have simulated shocks to every industry in the input output table and just for orientation 71 industries. So it's not super disaggregated. I mean, also not super aggregate compared to macroeconomic variables, but it's still fairly broad, right? So we run a shock on each of these sectors and then we simulate how this shock runs through the whole economy, resulting in an indirect um, impact on um, on, on the CPI, right? Because if the price of oil goes up, the price of plastic goes up, the price of plastic toys goes up. Mm -hmm. So therefore, in the CPI, you do not only have the direct effect of people, con uh, of people consuming fuel um, or gas, but you also have indirect effects of plastic right. and plastic toys and then in all sorts of packaging and so on, right? So we are tracing this direct and indirect effect um, that results from a price shock in any one individual sector and we run this um, this simulation um, for for every separate sector so that we then get um, distinct magnitudes that show us um, whether a shock to um, to to one sector matters more in comparison to another sector in other words we can create a ranking of what we call the total inflation impact from a shock in these sectors now um, with this simulation, we basically have um, three determinants that can render a sector systemically significant. The first determinant is the weight in the CPI, um, and housing is a great example here. Housing is not something that is very upstream and that creates a lot of ripple effects mm. in, in other industries, but it has a very large weight in the CPI, right? So therefore, um, if there is a price change in housing, it has a pretty large impact on um, on the CPI, um, something like um, like uh, oil and gas um, is actually pretty upstream, but not as upstream as something like wholesale trade um, because of the ways in which the upstreamness measures are constructed. Mm. But for oil and gas, um, you have very large price movements. So the magnitude of the shocks that we use um, are either using average um, volatilities um, in the in the two decades before the pandemic or using the actual price change in the pandemic and in the context of the Ukraine war. So in oil and gas, we actually had very large um, price movements already before the pandemic, and then again during the pandemic um, and in, in the context of the war. So here, the drivers would be kind of all three components. The importance um, in terms of indirect effects, um, creating a relatively large total um, weight in the CPI, um, the large um, price movements, and relatively upstream, even though not as upstream as wholesale trade. Whereas for wholesale trade, it's really um, bec basically because of the um, upstreamness of that sector. And then in the pandemic, of course, we also had fairly large price movements there. Um, but before the pandemic, the price movements in wholesale trade would have been much smaller than in, in something like oil and gas extraction, right? So it's it's these three dimensions that we are capturing in in um in creating this ranking so just on this point can, can i just press you when it comes to identifying the systemically important industries or i think you call them ubiquitous industries like how do you dis disaggregate their weight in the inflation indices versus the extent to which they matter for other prices because i'm sure there will be some people who, who listen to this and say like well obviously energy and you know 
maybe some consumer goods and things like that have a higher weight in the CPI. And so that's why you're getting these results. If you look at the paper, which I'm not expecting anyone to do, <laughs> um, we, can, we can distinguish between a direct and an indirect effect, right? So what our direct inflation impact is, is just the weight in the CPI, right? This is just giving you, this is what the CPI shows us um, uh, uh, is the weight of, um, of the change in, say, petroleum and coal products um, for um, the change in the CPI. Um, but then there's this additional share, um, which we call the indirect effect, which comes um, from tracing the indirect price um, uh, movements that result um, from this initial shock in, say, petroleum and coal products. Now, of course, we have to make assumptions on how industries um, uh, hand over um, uh, 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 cost increases, right? And we, in the paper, we make two distinct assumptions. One is that it's just a pass through of 100%. So firms just um, have a cost increase and just pass this on to their customers. The second assumption that we make is to say, um, what if firms actually don't just um, pass on the cost, but they actually want to protect their profit margins. Now, if their costs goes up, go up, and they mm. were to increase prices by just the amount of the um, increase in cost, their profit margin would go down, right? So what if um, what if they actually protect their, their profit margin, so therefore increase prices by more than the increase in costs? Um, so this then gives us different magnitudes of the total effect, but we find that the rankings are relatively stable, um, independent of, of these different um, assumptions that we are making. And the CPI that we are using here is a synthetic CPI because, of course, we have to break it down to um, these 71 um, industries that we have. Um, so it's, 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 it's not the CPI that you download from the BA um, if you just look for CPI, but it's a CPI that you get from the BA if you look into input-output tables. Hmm. You know, something I'm interested in, and I don't know if it's something you've specifically looked at, but it sort of reminds me of this. Like, you know, we talk a lot about, or economists have talked a lot in the last year about goods versus services inflation, as if these are like two distinct categories of types of things that people buy that you can draw a bright line and say, okay, goods have gone down, but service is still up. But it seems to me that any good that we buy is also implicitly a bundle of services that need to go into the, you know, if I buy a refrigerator, well, there's some sort of service person who helped delivery, deliver the furniture. Um, and there are services for, you know, the truck driver, or whatever it is. Does your approach, this sort of input-output approach, sort of, um, I, I'm trying to think exactly the way to phrase it, but in your view, does it offer a more useful way of thinking about categories of goods beyond just the, sort of what seem to me like these arbitrary distinctions between, between the types of things that get bought mm. in the economy? Good question. Yeah, great question. Um, uh, I mean, I would, of course, say yes. <laughs> um, okay, um, thank you. To be thank you for saying that was a great question. Okay, no, no, sorry, keep going. <laughs> um, to be sure, services are part of the input-output tables, and we actually find that they are pretty upstream because of the effect right. that you just described, right? Because there is like some form of even like small administrative service um, involved in pretty much everything. So if we talk about it, administ sorry, if we talk about upstream sectors, we tend to think about the physical stuff like oil and gas or yeah. metals or chemicals and so on, right? But what we actually see when we do the analysis that is that some that, that, that some services are very upstream. Now the price movements in services are relatively small on average over time because they're very much um, uh, tied to wages, right? And wages tend to move much less than let's say commodity prices, right? Mm -hmm. So therefore when we run these shocks the service um, sectors, even though um, they are pretty upstream, end up not being very important for the general movement um, of, of prices in in this model, um, because just the, the, the initial shock um, is so small if we model the shock um, uh, based on, on magnitudes of, of past um, price movements and price movements in the um, in the in the in the um, COVID-19 inflation. Now, um, I do think that this kind of does give us a different way of distinguishing 
um, uh, categories of, 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 of sectors, if you want so, um, because the idea here really is to say, okay, we don't care if it's services or if it's um, commodities or if it's processed goods or if it's manufacturing or whatever it might be, but all that we care about is um, the importance of this sector, It's if you want so, it's centrality in relation to um, all other sectors and in relation to um, people's um, um, uh, uh, consumption patterns, right? So what we find then is that the um, sectors that we identify as systemically significant are basically in three groups. So it's like basic necessities, stuff like housing, food, farms that of course produce a lot of um, food, utilities, um, and of course also energy, mm. and then basic production inputs, stuff like um, uh, the, the fossil fuels that we have already talked about, but also chemical products, um, and then kind of like basic circulation infrastructure so things like wholesale trade right which is critical for commerce it's a kind of a basic commercial infrastructure so i, I do think that this does give us a, a, a different way of kind of um uh, distinguishing um uh, the nature of different sectors so once you've identified these systemically important industries, um, you know, these ubiquitous industries for inflation, things like basic necessities, housing, farms, food and utilities and energy, how does that inform the, the policy yeah. response? So the idea here is that because these um, sectors are so important that um, if there are large um, price movements in these sectors, that ha this has implications way beyond um, these specific sectors, um, we should be paying more attention to what is happening in these sectors. So the first um, implication is to say, we need more monitoring capacity. Why do we need more monitoring capacity? Because we are living in some sort of a age of overlapping emergencies, right? Where um, we have, of course, a pandemic that is not over, um, looking, for example, at what's happening in China and how this um, impacts um, global production networks, but also looking at uh, climate change and your great episode on the Mississippi River um, and how this is a kind of just <laughs> um, uh, uh, making a whole um, uh, sector, in this case, of course, grain um, and, and other commodities um, grind to a hold. Um, but we also have these massive geopolitical tensions that can have um, huge implications for the ways in which production is organized globally. So in other words, uh, it seems very likely from my perspective that more shocks will be in the pipeline. Of course, no one wants these shocks and everybody is hoping that things will be calm and stable. Um, but um, but uh, uh, like from the perspective of the dynamics of overlapping emergencies, even if inflation is now easing, um, it seems like in the next couple of years, these kind of shocks um, are likely to keep um, coming. So if that is the case, you kind of want to have capacity on the side of the state to be able to monitor these sectors that are so important in um, in in ways that allow you to react to these shocks um, before they kind of create these um, huge um, cascading effects um, throughout the whole economy and you then actually get some sort of um, potentially more generalized um, kind of inflation. Um, beyond monitoring capacity, of course, it's not enough to watch. You want to be able to kind of um, step in and stabilize, right? And um, here then, um, I think the the big shift in, in um, policy thinking that emerges from this paper is that once we go on the sectoral level, we kind of leave the world of um, more or less homogeneous aggregates where we can talk about interest rates up by 1% or down by 1% or 0.5 or 0.75 or whatever, uh, but it's like pretty one dimensional, right? And pretty right. clear that there's like one dimension that we can measure in very clear ways quantitatively in percentage points, very straightforward. If we now think about the prices of chemicals or um, the stability of the flow of goods in wholesale trade and therefore um, the, the prices attached to wholesale trade or the prices of commodities, we enter the world of qualitative differences, right? We enter the world of the uh, the last um, uh, 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 two years of, of odd lots episodes, right, where you have been unpacking this um, incredible amount of detail on the qualitative differences um, that have huge quantitative implications for pricing, uh, but that require um, quite um, a, an extraordinary extent of 
um, understanding of the specific specifics of these sectors. So to be able to react to shocks in these um, sectors, I think um, one would really need quite a bit of capacity that is quite tailored to these sectors. So there's no like kind of um, uh, 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 one uh, solution that does right. it all. If you think about housing versus um, oil refineries, you would obviously right. need a very different kind of policy approach, right? D so this then means that kind of these, and, and I mean, there is a lot of ca capacity out there, but it needs to be connected back to the question of macroeconomic and monetary stability. It, it's always so funny to me that there exists a data point on the terminal that the Fed monitors called capacity utilization as if there's as if the concept of industrial capacity could ever be homogenized in a single index of like oh here's refining capacity here's apartment capacity here's capacity to make cars like it just like sort of blows my mind that that's like a that that could ever be boiled down to a single number let me ask you a random question is there a sector or a part of the economy that in your research surprised you hmm. as having uh more ripple effects across other prices than you might have expected that maybe people i mean oil is obvious right we all know that everything needs energy or whatever but are there sectors that maybe people don't think of that have outsized effects Generally speaking, I would say that the results are not terribly surprising, which um, might make you say like, yeah, then why bother modeling okay. it? Um, to which I would answer, well, it is nice to kind of be able to capture these aggregate effects and trace them in a systematic way throughout the economy. One of the sectors that I think is quite interesting is chemical products, like which is just in everything, right? It's like mm. as ubiquitous almost as um, as uh, as fossil fuels um, and um, is incredibly important and apparently is also important not only like from a quantity perspective of composition of production but also from a uh, from a price perspective so this is one that I personally hadn't hadn't thought about as much um, I think wholesale trade kind of came very much to um, to the top of our minds in the pandemic, but our simulations um, for before the pandemic um, also show that um, wholesale trade was already um, pretty important, which um, again is something that I think like from the pre-COVID mindset would not have been something that I would necessarily have associated with hmm. thinking about um, inflation. Wait, sorry, real quick, what do you, what's wholesale trade mean? You said, what, what, do we, what specifically are you talking about? Yeah, so wholesale trade, again, like this is actually one of the points where probably the level of aggregation can become a problem. I mean, generally speaking, it's stuff like logistics, but okay. also wholesale traders. I mean, any kind of company that um, that provide that, that, that basically does wholesale merchandising, right? Okay. Um, which, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, Isabella, can I ask one thing you mention in your paper, you talk about the possibility of minimum inventory requirements. So if you know that a specific industry or thing is important from an inflation perspective, maybe we should build in additional inventory, some resilience into the system. And this is, you know, inventories, um, the idea of businesses moving to just in time and maybe being a little bit more vulnerable to big shocks in demand. This is almost classic odd lots territory. And it seems like the difficulty there is how do you encourage companies to build up that extra capacity in their system when maybe their incentives are more skewed towards, right. you know, just making money and profits and, and short term things. How, how do you actually go about doing that? How realistic is it? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Um, and I think that um, I mean, if it is about making money and um, some of the companies that have experienced uh, bottlenecks actually have experienced that they have managed to increase their prices in ways that rendered them right. even more profitable than before the pandemic, right? So then your incentive of, um, uh, uh, of increasing your inventory might actually be pretty low because you think like in normal times, um, I don't want to uh, have inventories because I want to be as efficient as I can be. And then if shocks hit, if everybody is kind of um, uh, running this same model, like all competitors in one in one segment are running this same model, so then they all don't have a lot of inventories, then there's this like sector-wide um, supply chain shock, which allo allows them to hike prices in ways in which they could not hike prices in normal times because now they kind of have this mutual knowledge of um, of uh, of of shortage. Um, so 
and then they end up being actually in a pretty good position, um, which we have seen in, in, in some of the sectors that have experienced um, extreme um, uh, uh, impacts on, on their supply chains during the pandemic, right? So therefore, we somehow need a way to get out of this. And I think because of what I just um, laid out, it's not clear that companies by themselves would necessarily mm. um, increase the inventories right. in ways um, that, that, that sufficiently prevent this um, situation, um, at least not to the extent as it would be like kind of um, socially desirable or desirable from a more like um, macroeconomic kind of standpoint. How to do it practically, again, like I, I really see this paper as um, providing a framework and kind of starting a conversation. And I think to get to the question of how to do it practically, um, one really has to start um, talking to people who understand inventory right. management in companies, <laughs> rather than me like kind of as the armchair economist coming up with some, some sort of um, fix all the inventories of US corporations <laughs> in one type of approach. We're almost out of time. I have one very short question, but it, you know, we did an episode recently and it was pointed out by one of our guests that the way a lot of economists think is that if the price of gas goes down, for example, that doesn't improve inflation because the sort of general equilibrium, well, that's more money in people's pockets and they're just going to spend more on haircuts now or they're just going to spend more on cars. Why is there's does a limit that, to how many haircuts? People yeah, right. Get. Or maybe they'll spend more on going out to eat. OK, so uh, and then it doesn't really get us anywhere. Like, what do you say? I'm just curious your response to that. That's like, OK, you target a sector. Great. You target energy. Great. But then everything's cheaper. People have more money and they spend elsewhere and you don't get anywhere. Why should that not? Why is that not a fatal flaw of your approach? I mean, this is the famous, I mean, one of the famous Friedman, Milton Friedman quotes also where he's saying exactly yeah. what you just said. I mean, right? We're back to like monetar the sort of core monetarist thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this then kind of brings you back to the question of how firms are setting prices, right? Um, and if we are um, in a situation where we have very highly concentrated um, uh, corporate structures, which I think is a fairly fair description of large parts of the American economy, then we can actually see that um, uh, the, the demand response, sorry, that the price response to demand is surprisingly small in many cases, mm. and the prices are actually quite surprisingly stable. I mean, if you think back to the two decades, um, decades before COVID, um, where of course there have been um, periods of, uh, of more demand and less demand and so on, but prices were surprisingly stable, right? Yeah. And everybody was a kind of surprised, like, why are prices so stable? Well, um, because in uh, very concentrated sectors, firms tend to um, to compete over market share, um, compete over um, conquering new segments of markets, um, compete over cutting costs and so on, less than um, than um, using any kind of small increase in demand by immediately raising prices, right? Because if you raise prices and your competitor doesn't raise prices because both of you are price makers and not price takers, right. then um, that can actually harm you. <laughs> so therefore, um, in, in, in the kind of institutional setting that we find ourselves in, um, I don't think it's clear that um, if people uh, spend less on gas, then immediately the prices of everything else um, right. that they are um, consuming are going up. And I also don't think that this is something that we see empirically, that the, the, the price of gas and oil going down, the inflation in, in, yeah. in other um, parts of the economy suddenly like going up by any large margins. Uh, Isabella, we're going to have to leave it there, but thank you so much for coming on Odd Lots. Uh, you're definitely one of our favorites, and I'm not just saying that because you've translated the past two years into actual academic research. Um, fascinating <laughs> discussion. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much, Isabella. That was great. Thank you. Thanks, Isabella. That conversation was great, um, and the paper is definitely worth a read, although I know Isabella said she didn't think anyone was actually going to read it. One thing I was thinking is it does kind of go back to, remember some of the conversations we had with Stephanie Kelton mm -hmm. on modern yeah. monetary theory, and you know, her solution was, well, 
we need instead of reducing spending like maybe yeah. we identify where the bottlenecks are happening and we increase capacity or try to increase capacity and my criticism of that was it's difficult to do it in real time but i think studies like this maybe yeah. go some way towards identifying where to look right i think this use of input output mm. tables and as uh, isabella said is actually a very old thing that you never hear mainstream economists talk about I, you know yeah is could be is like very useful idea and like okay it's like difficult sure it's a lot more difficult to like identify critical sectors than it is to just raise rates when cpi comes in higher than expected but it's doable and i did read the paper but when i say i read the paper what i mean is i read the first four pages skipped over the 40 pages of equations you in have the to middle. do the intro and then the conclusion yeah so i read then... the i read the intro i skipped over like all the equations and greek symbols or whatever and then the conclusion it, and i thought it was really uh interesting and i think like I suspect, and maybe as a result of all this, the pandemic and everything, there might be renewed interest yeah. in this sort of like pretty rigorous approach to identifying critical sectors and how they distribute prices across the economy. Exactly this. I would be really disappointed if we came out of the past two or three years without a sort of like new way of thinking about inflation, or at least maybe an additional dimension. Yeah. All right, shall we leave it there? Let's leave it there. This has been another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. You can follow me on Twitter at Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisenthal. You can follow me on Twitter at The Stalwart. Follow our guest, Isabella Weber. She's at Isabella M. Weber. And check out her paper, Inflation in Times of Overlapping Emergencies, Systemically Significant Prices from an Input-Output Perspective. Follow our producers, Carmen Rodriguez at Carmen Armin and Dash Bennett at Dashbot. And check out all of our podcasts at Bloomberg under the handle at podcasts. And for more Odd Lots content, go to Bloomberg.com slash Odd Lots, where we post transcripts, Tracy and I blog, and we write a weekly newsletter every Friday. Go there, subscribe to it, get it in your inboxes. Thanks for listening.